everyone, it's Rachel Wolfson here at Consensus 2024 in Austin, Texas, and I'm so excited to be interviewing the one and only David Schwartz. He is the CTO of Ripple. He needs no introduction, so let's get right to the interview. So David, um, you know, first and foremost, what are your thoughts on Consensus? Uh, it's always an amazing conference. It's great to see all the business people and developers, you know, talking to each other. Um, it's a little hard for me to cross the room sometimes. I a lot of people who want to talk to me. So, uh, but it is amazing. The energy has been fantastic. Yeah. So you recent, or I guess Ripple recently announced a um, institutional DeFi development. Is that correct? Yeah. It, it's kind of it's kind of like our vision for how you can have institutions that have regulatory compliance issues that can operate on decentralized blockchains that are censorship resistant and you know have no governance functions. They can still meet their regulatory compliance objectives and not the islands that can't interoperate with like real DeFi ecosystems where there's people who you know may have anonymous accounts or they may be unbanked or not, you know, they may, they, it's, a, it's a way to have all those two ecosystems work together. Okay. Can you explain a little bit more about how, what the new developments are exactly? Well, so a good example is Ripple launching a stablecoin. So the stablecoin is regulated, you know, it's launched pursuant to licensing that Ripple has. It's one-to-one -one back with U.S. dollars. And Ripple has to go through, you know, know your customer and anti-money laundering for any time we issue a redeem. But people will be able to obtain the stable coin like on DEXs and, you know, through exchanges. And they may be able to transact with it in DeFi applications that are censorship resistant and, you know, that are decentralized. And the vision is more products like that. So another example would be real-world asset tokenization, where these are regulatory compliant products that are securities on blockchains, but they can be used as collateral in DeFi protocol. So I might have Apple stock and someone is lending you money against that stock. And the stock is provided by a regulatory compliance system, but the lending system is a DeFi application. So it's this idea of bridging regulatory compliant institutional use cases with these uh, DeFi use cases that are made, can't really be tied to a jurisdiction, can't really be tied to more, those strict regulatory compliance policies in ways that all work together on a public blockchain like the XRP. So are any institutions utilizing this just yet? There are a lot of institute. Well, stablecoins a good example. You know, there are many stablecoins that are issued in just this way. There are a lot of tokenized securities today that are available. Um, there's like tokenized um, U.S. Treasuries. Um, there are some companies working. Uh, Zonix, for example, one of our partners is working on tokenizing real world assets. So it's happening. It's happening gradually. When you say tokenizing real world assets, can you be a little bit more specific? Are there specific assets that Ripple is focusing on when it comes to tokenization? Well, obviously the stable Bitcoin tokenized is a U.S. dollar, which is a real-world asset, right? There'll be treasuries or there'll be like literal U.S. dollars one-for-one one backing it. With these like uh, securities, there may be specifically treasuries where there's a yield that's delivered to the holder through a regulated product where the holders probably you know, can't be anonymous. They have to onboard. But those things will still be connected to DeFi applications. Got it. Okay. Does the Ripple stablecoin have a name yet? <laughs> we will be announcing that at Apex. Okay. Good to know. Any other new developments that you spoke about um, here at Consensus or anything that we need to know about? Well, we've announced a couple of other strategies for the XRP Ledger. One of them is Oracles, which are another example. Like the Oracles themselves tend to be regulated institutions. Some of them are DeFi projects, but they enable DeFi applications that are sort of jurisdictionless, like collateralized lending. You can't do collateralized lending if you don't know the value of the collateral. We've also started to talk about a proposal for what we call multi-purpose tokens, which are um, so the, the XRP Ledger has fungible tokens like that are great for things like stablecoins, and it has non-fungible tokens that are great for things like collectibles. Um, but there's sort of like an in-between for things like carbon credits, where they're sort of fungible and sort like one carbon credit is a lot like another. So you probably don't want like an NFTs for them, but they're not really they're not really fungible because they're issued like against different projects that may have different regimes, and so you have like lots and lots of assets. Concert tickets are another thing. They're sort of fungible, but they're they're sort of not because seats are different and you don't want 0.997 of a concert ticket like how does do we let you in or what if we have 100 people that each have 99% of a concert ticket like what do we do and so these multi-purpose tokens can have regulatory compliance information attached to the token but they can also have properties that are between non-fungible tokens and fungible tokens that allow you to address these other use cases without kind of bashing a square peg into a round hole. 
Okay, and that was just announced today, the multi-purpose I think, one? Yeah, I think, I think the first announcement was either in our blog post or in my talk uh, a couple hours ago, both of which I think were today. Yeah. What do you think in terms of the regulatory space when it comes to things like tokenization of real-world assets and just other things that we tokenize? Do you think we're starting to see kind of progress being made on the regulatory side to enable this? Yeah, I think big institutions that have the wherewithal to go through even in you know very heavy um, very heavy jurisdictions like the United States where it's very challenging the EU where it's challenging to launch these products large institutions have really come to believe that there's going to be tens of trillions of dollars in real world assets tokenized and they don't want to let somebody else beat them to it and so we're seeing a lot of interest from like tier one banks and very large institutions that have said like we're going to have to figure out a way to do this and obviously they're going to be have to be strict regulatory compliance this probably won't be assets that like anonymous accounts can hold but you may be able to do things like borrow against them that will kind of again bridge that gap between them because if it's strictly if it's completely regulated and only people who on board with the issuer can use them there's really no advantage than being on a public ledger but we think that even those things can tie into DeFi applications in useful ways right and I just read a great article about credit unions um, token using tokenization for loans and everything so apparently credit unions the regulator he's here and he's very open to blockchain and tokenization. So we may see it first with credit unions and then maybe larger banks. I hope so because there's a lot of people who don't have access to good ways to produce yield, low risk ways to produce yield. And these types of loans, these types of loans, they're great for the people who borrow the money. You know, they can be tax efficient, they can be a way to like juice a little more return. That's not super exciting to me though. What is exciting is people who might have to like stuff money in their mattress um, will be able to provide pools of liquidity that will be that will back these loans and get a yield at a reasonably low risk in a way that's like it's like an open system that's accessible to people who don't who are very underserved by the existing financial system. So that's exciting to me. Right. Any other upcoming announcements from Ripple that we can talk about or that we can expect maybe at Apex coming up in June in Amsterdam? So we have a whole bunch of announcements planned for Apex, including announcements around the stable coin partnerships, but uh, you know they'll they'll fire me if I tell you anything. You know. Sorry. Okay, so we'll just have to wait. David, any final thoughts or remarks before we end our interview? Anything that you're really excited about? You know, I've been really, I, 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 I'm unreasonably excited about the automated market maker feature just because that's something that's near and dear to my heart because I've been working on trading algorithms and, and volatility harvesting and those kinds of things for a long time. It's exciting, you know, to see those things happen. And I'm also excited to share what I think is a coherent vision for how we can grow. Like, like if you look at how the internet grew, it was institutional adoption, there was government and military adoption, and that went hand in hand with sort of bottom-up adoption to make a compelling, you know, a compelling ecosystem. And I think like that this vision to do that with blockchain, you know, is, is just really exciting. There's been a lot of people working on the sort of bottom-up growth for a long time, which is like, but that really only appeals to people who like are real are technologists who are really willing to get their hands dirty in the tech. Mass adoption is going to take a mixture of institutional adoption and grassroots adoption. It's exciting to see like the industry kind of turning that corner. For sure, the industry is maturing and Definitely. hopefully we'll get some friendly regulations that are clear and concise moving forward. I hope so. I, 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 it, it hurts me that people, I have to tell people like to avoid the United States when they can. But, uh, but you know, things have been getting better, I think, yeah. in the last couple of months. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful. Yeah, wonderful. Well, David, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much. Same here. Great talking to you, Rachel.